anti-intellectualism video, you can tell a lot of a society by the buildings that they erect. There's a specific reason why the World Trade Center was targeted for destruction. Because it is a representation, the actual building is a representation of American economic prowess, American economic might. Right? That's undeniable. And insofar as those buildings are targeted, it's a direct assault on the economic prowess, the economic dominance of the United States of America. And history might tell the tale, I hope it doesn't, but history might tell the tale that it was that moment when, you know, the United States of America really began to lose its sort of global superpower status, right? I hope that isn't the case because I'm an American and I live in America and I want to see my country as strong as possible. But the idea is that the aesthetic destruction of the building itself, of the temple itself, the destruction, the collapse of the building, is a means of reflecting then back on the system itself, the ideological substrate. Is there really a God? I mean, these guys are destroying these buildings. Like, and, and, I, and I read what Nietzsche said. Is there really, I mean, does this really make sense to even erect a building like this to God if there is no God? If there really isn't a God, does it make sense to have a building where people go to worship God? I'm not going to hear the answer to that, but I do want to pose the question. Similarly, if capitalism, is there really capitalism? Does capitalism really exist? Is there such a thing as capitalism? Yes, no. If it doesn't exist, does it make sense having an entire building that represents capitalism? Right? Why have the building if there isn't this thing? Right? So you, ha you, you have to see the consistency in the argument, right? If the artists present, if the, if the engineers present us with these epic, massive edifices of, of devotion, in a, you know, literally or figuratively, and they are themselves, the building of themselves informed by some belief system or some ideology, and we say that Nietzsche destroys God and therefore the building must collapse. Well, if capitalism, if capitalism let's say 1.0, is and has exhausted itself, then it makes sense that the buildings that represent that ideological belief fall, right? Um, I would argue, sort of just sort of in anticipation, that there would have to be um, a revival, right? Just as, because I, I've read a lot of history, right? There's going to be revivals in Christendom, revivals in Islam, revivals in Judaism, right? Which will lead to the erection of new buildings that represent new revivals. And I would argue, similarly, on purely an aesthetic recognition of the structure of the building and the relationship between the emotional, aesthetic, the, the, the experience of the building, that the collapse of that building, you know, might lead in a good sense, in good in terms of good for America, maybe bad for others, but in the erection of a new building, a revival of our economy, not in terms of capital and GDP, but a, a real revival in the way in which we conceptualize capitalism, right? Capitalism 2.0, this new next wave, right? And that might manifest in any number of ways, right? But the way that we begin to access what this revival might be, this economic revival, not in terms of generating more capital, but in terms of the way in which capital is generated. A new way of doing it, a new form, will lead eventually, because someone, many of us, will, will synthesize this new thing, will lead to the erection of a new building, which represents the new system. Right? But if, if as he says, and this is straight from Heidegger, right? he says, um, as long as the God has not fled from it, right? The building has significance as long as God is in the building. Once capitalism 1.0 dies out, um, once capitalism 1.0 runs its course, the building that represents capitalism 1.0 has to, in a sense, collapse, right? And I'm not trying to be tongue-in-cheek with that, and please don't send me a whole bunch of hate mail for that. It's just an, an analysis, and it's rooted in friggin' Heidegger, right? So just think openly about it, right? That there is a sense in which our economic system, it was, it was a prelude, right? It's in terms of literature and aesthetics, it would be called foreshadowing, potentially, right? It would, the collapse of the building is a foreshadowing to the transformation in our economic system. 
which I would argue, this might be generations from now, but I would argue would lead to the erection of a new economic structure, a literal building, a literal structure that, and it might be online, right? Um, so it might be a virtual structure that represents this new system, right? It's, it's sort of what we do as human beings, right? Um, it's hard to analyze it without sort of being rooted in, steeply rooted in, in literature. I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the product, this presentation, my lectures are a product of, you know, a decade worth of research, really. Okay. So discuss the supertemporal aspect of the presence of being as physics. I think I already did that. Right, we talked about what it is that is metaphysics, the relationship between metaphysics and epistemology, um, the way in which individuals um, bring to reality the truths of the metaphysical world and demonstrate this, right? That we talked about that. So the linguistic work as art originating in the speech of people does not refer to X. It transforms the people's sayings. This is from Heidegger. Rhetoric, logic, argumentation, education isn't, isn't a means of referring, of pointing people to truth. As I said in my anti-intellectualism video, uh, after I got back from Oxford, um, it's a means of transforming people. Right? You can change people. You can change people's lives. You can change the way people relate to each other. You can change the way people think, for good or for bad. Right? You can indoctrinate people. You can liberate people. As I said, rather honestly, in that that video, there are parts of me which are prone to indoctrination. I do believe some things we should we should try to indoctrinate people to believe X. Right? Nationalism, patriotism, what have you. Um, there are parts of me that think individuals should be liberated. If I'm the person that is responsible for this act, um, I want you to realize that when you come to me for information, that there is that potential. I want you to be critical of what it is that I say because I am prone to uh, propagate indoctrination, as we all are. And anyone who tells you that they're not is precisely indoctrinating you. You should be hypercritical of everything that you see, right? But the idea is, once you recognize this, it transforms the way in which you perceive the world. I'm, a, I'm skeptical, but it's not like I, I, my nihilism results in a denial of the world. Right? I recognize that there is a mind-independent external world. I recognize that there are um, subjective experiences that I will never have epistemological access to. And I am very, very comfortable, as a human being, appreciating this distinction. And that appreciation is an aesthetic mode, right? It is my subjective experience of otherness, if you will, to be technical, right? Otherness in terms of architecture, in terms of art, in terms of people, right? I, I have an appreciation for that distinction, and that, that distinction in no sense threatens me. Un unfortunately, for so many people, that distinction does threaten them, right? Capitalism is perceived as a threat. Maybe rightfully or not, I'm not here to justify it or talk about it, blah, 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 I'm just throwing it out there, right? Religion is perceived as a threat. Education is perceived as a threat, right? But it's the perception of that threat that really serves as the, the primary foundational role for conflict. If you can transform the way in which that quote-unquote threat is perceived such that it's no longer a threat, cool, you believe in a different God than me. Okay, great. Okay, you don't believe in God. Okay, whatever. Okay, you believe that capitalism is great? Sure. You believe that socialism is better? Pfft, I don't care. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's hard. You know, when I do my video of what I believe, and I say I believe in all these gods, and I believe in all these belief systems, everybody's like, you're confusing yourself. You can't. Well, I mean, that's what I believe, right? I, that's what I believe. Okay. Um... So distinctions between language and the utility of language as art, I'll explain that in a second. And then the last bit in this section, uh, the appearance of the polemics, right? The idea is that there is an apparent polemical relationship between the production of the artwork, the production of the piece. Think about this polemics now. This is a very important piece, right? The artist produces this piece, but people, some people, have an inability to disassociate the artist. Remember, Heidegger says that the artist is inconsequential to the artwork. I just said that. 
So if the artist is inconsequential to the artwork, and you don't like the fact that the artist has this political affiliation, or this artist has this economic affiliation, you contaminate the artwork by infusing the artist's character in the work. What you should do is recognize, Heidegger would argue, and I would agree with him 100%, that in terms of um, an aesthetic appreciation, you should, you should diffuse, right? you should separate the structures of the individual, or institution even, from the actual, from the artwork. If you look at the, the World Trade Towers as the final product of engineering, uh, of an engineering marvel, and the work that went into the construction of the World Trade Centers, and the fact that people traveled from all over the world to New York City to see the, the aesthetic and appreciate the, 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 the magnitude of the building. It was definitely undeniable and aesthetic. The destruction of the World Trade Center wasn't just a destruction of the economics center, the economic hub of the United States. It wasn't just a critique or an attack on capitalism. It was an attack on, I hate to say it like this, but it was an attack on an American aesthetic. In the United States of America, this is what we pride. It's not bad or good. We, we put our pride in our skyscrapers, right? It's an, it's an attack on an American aesthetic. As Americans, we appreciate this aesthetic. And it could be interpreted as a rejection of, this is a much deeper level, right? But it could be interpreted, the attack. So, uh, September 11th could be interpreted as, uh, as an attack on the Amer American aesthetic. Americans are gaudy. They're into the biggest, grandiose, huge, monolithic structures, right? This is exactly why Americans carry themselves the way they do. They're so arrogant and massive and overbearing. My, and I, I think that's really problematic, right? I really think that at its, at a, I wouldn't say its deepest core, but a much, much deeper core, I think that's really problematic because if it is, not only the obvious assault on our economic um, magnitude, but also a much deeper level, a much more nuanced and subtle, latent level, an attack on the aesthetic, the American aesthetic, which is interpreted as being overbearing and greed-filled and monolithic. Um, and people would say this is why Americans look the way they do or act the way they do. There might be any ridiculous number of justifications for this. Or, I shouldn't say ridiculous, there might be some legitimate justifications for this, I apologize for that. There might be some legitimate justifications for this. There's, you know, there is a sense in which the American aesthetic needs to have an opportunity, at least. I mean, people can't deny this, right? There has to be a, an opportunity, at least, to explain why it is that we like this. This is why we like this. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Give us an opportunity to explain why we like the things that we like. It's not that we're trying to be bigger and better than everybody else, it's X. Right? And I'm not here to facilitate that, well, I guess I am here to facilitate that discussion. That's the whole point of this, but I'm not here to give you the answer to that discussion. So, with that, I want to stop here. Um, and thank you for watching my videos. I hope I didn't go too far off on a deep end. But, um, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Thanks for watching my videos. Have a good day.